getting a look over your WebEx plan. Um, everyone has me to their lines. Big thank you. There is a Q&A section. Um, so post all your questions there. Uh, we will be recording this. So Cheryl, if you want to get that started, that would be super. Um, it will be available on the NDIA website. Uh, and the slide that Joanne is using that you see in front of you uh, is part of the um, the, uh, the presentation itself. Um, and the slide is also currently on the um, the event notes on the NDIA website, so you can actually grab that slide right now yourself if you like um, from from our site. Uh, well, one, as you're coming in and getting settled, if you would mute your line, that's helpful to all of us. Um, keep myself a little bit since we have more folks jumping on right now. There's a Q&A on your um, WebEx platform. So throw some questions in there as we're going along, and I will interject them in presentation as appropriate. I'm Angela Seifer. I'm the director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Super excited to be having this webinar. Uh, Joanne is the president of CTC Technology and Energy, and she works with their public sector clients, and she promotes the, the issues around broadband. Um, but she, she dives in in a more uh, infrastructure kind of way than most of us in the NDIA world do, um, helping folks think about public-private partnerships, um, developing new kinds of solutions to broadband, and she very get much gets our concerns about affordability. Often in our world, we um, we hear a lot about infrastructure and the need for a gig, and that frustrates some of us who are concerned about affordability of 25 meg or even 10 meg. Um, so um, she is figuring out how to mesh those issues, and that's super exciting. Uh, and there are more and more public officials that are recognizing the necessity of not only fabulous broadband, but affordable fabulous broadband. Uh, so we're going to get started. Joanne, I'm going to hand this over to you for you to take it from here. Thank you, Jala. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you today. As Ayla said, um, my colleagues and I tend to work on the infrastructure and supply and development side of the broadband equation, um, but that deeply relates to access, relates to affordability. Um, we are not digital inclusion professionals, but we are e extremely um, respectful of the work that NDIA does. In fact, I'd go further and say it's quite extraordinary what NDIA has accomplished in a relatively short period of time, and it's really a privilege to be with all of you today. So what I want to do today is, um, is a, uh, a, a fully comprehensive um, view of the way we tell the story of broadband. And my partner and I started doing this in 1996 which is the year I think of as the advent of the commercial Internet. By the way, just think about that for a moment. Think about how extraordinary that is. The commercial Internet, born in 1995, 1996, that is just two decades ago. For many consumers, understanding that the Internet was out there, knowledge of it even as something that they didn't use, didn't happen for a number of years after that. But in, obviously, a remarkably short period of time, this infrastructure has had an extraordinary impact on the way our economy functions and on the way our democracy functions. And the story we tell is one that essentially starts in that time period, 1995, 1996. Internet itself, um, Carol, I'm going to ask you to please close out of Outlook because I think we are you're seeing all of your notifications as they come up. That's <laughs> so not Outlook. It's something else happening. Okay. I'm trying to get that off. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So you all know what's on Cheryl's agenda for today because you're looking at her desktop. Um, it, um, as I was saying, the, um, the, the, the history of the Internet obviously goes back okay. before its advent as a commercial matter, as a commercial enterprise. Um, and we all know that history, yep. which has to do with the military. Um, 
but the, the story of the commercial Internet is the one that the slide attempts to tell. I'm going to ask everyone to please mute yourselves if you're not already mute because we're getting quite a bit of background noise. Um, so for those, as we look at this slide, as you look at what our engineers are trying to convey on this slide, they're telling a story about speed and capacity of data networks. Um, but it's also a historical story in many ways. If you look at the um, access that extends, bar that extends across the middle of the slide, beginning at the far left with about 50 kilobits per second, that is dial-up speed internet. That is also where we were in that time period I was describing, 1995, 1996. Um, and in that way, this bar across the screen is a timeline as well as a measure of speeds. It extends through megabits and into a full gigabit, um, getting toward the right of the screen, and will in fact go far beyond a gigabit and does already in many networks and in the backbone of most networks. So that what we are looking at really is um, a timeline that also extends into the future, although we can't see exactly what it looks like in the future. But this is the history, the story that it tells. And I'm going to start with the wireline technologies and how they developed and how they interacted with each other and reacted to each other, because it tells you a lot about how we have ended up where we are. Wireline technologies are above the line. Wireless technologies are below the line. And I'm not going to go into any kind of detailed technical um, descriptions of how the technologies themselves function, um, although I'm happy to provide you all with a paper that's been written by our engineers that attempts to do exactly that. It's a technical description for non-engineers that may be helpful to you. Rather than describing the technologies, what I'm going to do here is describe their evolution from a business and a market sense and what kind of impact that has had on the availability and the affordability of broadband for consumers. And I'm going to talk about it for the most part through the prism of the needs of the residential community. And when we, we think about the broadband from a market standpoint, we think about the broadband market from a segment standpoint, when we develop business plans, the way the industry usually will divide the it up is in terms of the residential market. You know, that's apparent. That's consumers in their homes of various sorts, whether single family or multi dwelling or other. Um, the small and medium business market, which in some sometimes is is um, grouped together with residential, because many of the products are essentially the same. Uh, um, unless that smaller medium business is willing to pay for a much higher quality product, which may or may not be available. And then there's what's known as the enterprise market, which refers to large institutions, government, big businesses, hospitals, um, of course, schools, libraries, many of the people in our own community. But these are the big dollar customers, and that is the enterprise market. These are dramatically different markets, and the industry builds different kinds of networks and offers different products for those different markets. I speak mostly about the residential market today because I think that's at the heart of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about access and affordability and inclusion. But I'll also talk a bit about what this means for small businesses because I think that for small business owners, whether running their businesses in their homes or in small business neighborhoods, the story is pretty critical too, and they actually have quite a bit less access and less affordability than even many folks who work in our field know. So let's start with that as a framework and kind of dive in. So if you look at the far left there, where we're looking at that dial-up um, begin of the commercial internet, as I said, 95, 96, this is the birth of internet as a commercial enterprise. This was the explosion of interest and use by consumers in that period in the late 1990s um, that later became known as the dot-com era when suddenly there was the sense that there is a business out there and nobody was quite sure how it was going to be monetized. Nobody was quite sure how the um, Internet was going to make money for anyone. But what was pretty clear was 
um, it pretty clear that there was an opportunity on the infrastructure side, on the availability side, for companies to get into the business of offering Internet service. The companies that were offering services over the Internet, the, the dot-coms themselves, that was a whole different business that was just starting to emerge. But the Internet service provision business was, it was a very exciting and interesting moment at that time. I was actually coming out of graduate school at the time, as was my partner, and my kind of fondest memory of that time period was of how many of our colleagues and friends dropped out of graduate school to go start dial-up ISPs. There were thousands of dial-up ISPs all over the country, and there was this incredible commercial excitement. And the service was available to anyone who had a phone line because that was the nature of dial-up. It traveled over the old phone lines that had been deployed by the companies in some cases in the late 19th century, in some cases in the 20th century, but using this old copper infrastructure, this old copper technology that was essentially 100 more years old. And the new technology was the dial-up modem that now made it possible to transfer data bits as well as voice over the network, and that made it possible to use this network for purposes of what we call the Internet. Very exciting time. What's also incredibly important about that time period is that the industry more broadly broadly, I know that there was a massive business opportunity here. The, the advent of the Internet as a major commercial uh, enterprise and opportunity caught the attention in a very significant way, not just of the phone companies, which had you know, were saying essentially were providing all of this transport for these dial-up Internet service providers, but even more importantly, really, for the cable industry. And so what we see in about the 1998-1999 time period is the advent of cable as an Internet platform. Dial-up is what we would generally call a narrowband service, a narrowband infrastructure, just narrow, um, uh, a narrowband in which those bits travel over the network. The birth of the broadband Internet is really the birth of the cable modem. When the cable industry its development and research arm, which is known as Cable Labs, and with the participation of a number of other research facilities, developed the cable modem uh, technology that allowed the cable industry to deploy something known as DOCSIS. And for those of you who are very technical, I apologize. I'm telling you things that you already know. For people um, like me who are not engineers, I'm hoping that this is um, helpful and that I'm not using too much jargon. Again. But the cable modem technology, which it's not important what it does or what it means, but it's just it's called DOCSIS. The protocol is called DOCSIS. Was developed in the late 1990s. And first cable networks were made to use DOCSIS to go two-way and become internet platforms in about 98, 99. In the same way as the cable industry right now is gradually doing its latest DOCSIS upgrade, which is to a technology oh, called DOCSIS 3.1. What is happening at the, what happened in that 98, 99 time period is that the first generation of DOCSIS was deployed on a gradual basis by the cable industry, starting with some trials in select communities and then being extended pretty much through 100% of the cable footprint throughout the United States between about 98 and maybe 2002, 2003. That is the advent of the broadband Internet as opposed to the narrowband Internet that existed before that. What was really amazing about this and the reason when you look at that oval above line um, and you see the beginning of that oval, which is showing you the speeds possible with cable modem infrastructure, and you look at even the low end of what was being deployed in that 98-99 time period of about 5 megabits per second and up, in on-stream direction, very important, by the way, cable modem has never been a symmetrical technology. It's always been faster in on-stream than in the upstream. But when you look at those numbers, that was a massive increase over what dial-up was capable of doing. And the reason for that is that the infrastructure that the cable modem industry, that the cable industry was using, was the cable networks that were deployed in metro areas throughout the United States in the 1970s and 1980s. And these networks were not the old kinds of copper networks that the phone companies had deployed a century earlier. They were much 
better, more capable form of outside plant infrastructure that was a combination of a little bit of fiber optics in the backbone or the core of the network and a technology known as coaxial cable, which is really copper in its way, but is more robust and capable than the old phone line copper. Most of the network was this coaxial cable. Coax cable was always a broadband medium. It was capable of carrying more information than the old phone modems were, excuse me, than the old phone lines were. And so when the cable industry developed cable modem technology and we're now delivering a two-way data product over network, even the network had been designed originally in the 70s and 80s for one-way video, by virtue of the time frame in which those networks had been built, really only 10 or 15 or 20 years earlier than they went to internet, the cable industry had a massive advantage over the phone industry because of the core infrastructure they were using. It was newer, it was coaxial cable, it had some fiber, and it was not the old phone line um, copper infrastructure. And that's why you see these much faster speeds here with regard to cable modem than you do with regard to dial-up. Now, at the same time as all of this was happening, Happening in these early years of the broadband internet, back 98 to maybe 2003, 2004, the phone industry was not just sitting still and waiting. It was developing a faster mechanism for using the old copper phone lines to get to faster speeds itself. And the technology it was um, developing um, was, yeah, and is still in use today is something called digital subscriber line or DSL. If you look at the oval for DSL, that's the same phone company infrastructure that had been used with dial-up, but new electronics, it was able to get to much, much faster speeds. In fact, to get to speeds that in those days we called broadband, and even now the very best DSL networks, if you are located very close to equipment and if the company really supports the network and invests in it and upgrades it periodically, you can get some pretty decent broadband speeds that you could be on the very low end of these um, speed tiers over DSL. And you can see when you compare those two ovals, DSL versus cable modem, you can see a dramatic difference in terms of how far they extend across the speed line. And frankly, that means thing about how far they will extend into the future, if this is a timeline as well as a speed line. Because the inherent limitations of DSL are based not only on the fact that some companies in an effort to actually support them and improve them, and frankly, many of the phone companies are not doing that currently, which is, you know, that's a pretty significant problem. But there's a built-in problem, which is that they're using that 100-year-old copper, which just by its nature is going to really struggle to keep pace. It was not developed as a broadband technology. Huge disadvantage relative to cable modem. The deal upgrade path to really get DSL to my faster speeds is effectively means the element of DSL. For phone companies to get to really fast speeds, and of course the magic is all at the top, we see fiber to the premises. Um, to get to really fast speeds, DSL is going to have to be um, effectively discontinued as a technology, and what the phone industry is going to need to do is build a whole lot more fiber. The upgrade path for that phone infrastructure going from dial-up to DSL to whatever comes beyond DSL is fiber to the premises. It's not just an equipment upgrade. It involves a massive outside plant upgrade. And Verizon did some of this 10 or so years ago in some select Verizon markets and then effectively backed off for the most part. Um, this is, of course, the technology we've seen Google deploy. But in terms of phone company upgrades, what we are seeing is um, fits and starts of development of new fiber to the premises capabilities. AT&T is probably doing a bit more than the other phone companies right now, but it's being done on a select basis in a neighborhood by neighborhood fashion and where it's cost effective and where there might already be some backbone fiber that can be cost effectively extended. And, and when you're looking at your communities, and in most of our communities, the phonies are saying that they're building a lot more fiber because that they know is the logical upgrade path. 
in my experience, they're actually doing quite a bit less than they say they're doing, or, or let's say the, the PR tends to overstate how much is happening, how much new fiber is actually being built. And this is part of the explanation of why, is that the upgrade path for that old, old phone company structure effectively means replacing almost all of the infrastructure. It's extraordinarily costly. It's unbelievably expensive, and that's why we're seeing it on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood, neighborhood, sometimes street-by-street street basis rather than a comprehensive basis. It's because it started with this core weakness of having on those poles and under um, the ground and conduit structure that was so old that it's simply not capable of getting to the kinds of speeds where it would be capable of competing in the long term with cable modem, certainly not with fiber. Now, worry about cable modem and what that upgrade path looks like and what that looks like in terms of access and availability is a missed one. The cable industry, without question, has this better medium, this better infrastructure, and this huge built-in advantage. Um, with respect to the, the core medium, as I described a few minutes ago, having hybrid fiber coax networks instead of copper networks. But there are limitations to that as well. First one is just the nature of how the networks got built historically. Cable in, in its early years, in the era of um, uh, deployment in the late 1970s and 1980s was the means by which people got video. It was a one-way video platform. Well, modem made it possible for it to go two ways, but by its nature, in its in the year when it was first built, it was built to home in metropolitan areas. That's the major limitation that is so consequential here. As a product was entertainment product and businesses of any size, but particularly small and medium businesses, weren't purchasers of video products. It simply wasn't a service that people used in the office. As a result, when these cable networks got built in the 1970s and 1980s, they were built in residential areas. They were not built in small and medium business areas, and they weren't built to big businesses or technology parks or industrial parks and so on. All of that was fine in the cable television era. In an internet era, that creates enormous problems if you're a small or medium business. And I can't think of a single city or town I've visited in the last 10 years where this has not been a really significant issue, which is that cable modem offering for a small business is simply not available in small business areas or even in like downtown streets or in, in little segments of a neighborhood that are small business surrounded by residential areas, the infrastructure simply wasn't built to pass those small businesses. And while the cable industry has started offering business services, where it builds its network is to large businesses, to the big dollar customers, that's not a judgmental statement. <laughs> That's just a statement of what all industry players do. You're going to make an investment to get to big dollar customers like hospitals, like large companies, like factories, and so on, in ways that you would not make to get to a, a street of mom and pop stores. As a result, what we have is um, an, a situation where cable modem technology is quite capable, sometimes very affordable, if you get the service, but if you're in a small or medium business area, you simply can't get the service, and the cost of having the cable industry build it to you could be, or in the tens, or in some cases, we have seen um, estimates in hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this network built to you so that you can get a basic small business product. Is a That's an affordability issue as well as an access issue, and it's a fortunate side effect of the way the network developed. Here's a positive side effect of the way the cable modem network developed. And those of you who know me know that I've been an advocate for local governments and broadband for a very long time. And here's a really proud story about what local governments were able to accomplish in the broadband space. When the cable networks were built out in the 1970s and 1980s, they were franchised by local government and regulated to some degree by local government. And one of the things that local governments insisted on in these franchise agreements was that the cable industry had to build to the entire residential community, not only to select neighborhoods. So unlike the phone company upgrades of the current moment in which what we see happening is 
picking of neighborhoods, sometimes by density, but a lot of the time based on demographics. Unlike that, when the cable networks were built in the 70s and 80s, they were to everyone up to certain kinds of density levels. So the one exception to build out requirements for residences in most cable franchise agreements was based on density. If there were only going to be a few homes on a road, um, usually based on a linear mile measure, then there was not a requirement to build. But as long as that density was there, and in most metro areas it was there, there was a requirement of 100% access. The network had to go everywhere. And this was important for purposes of cable television and entertainment, but it's when networks went two-way in the late 1990s and the beginning of this century, this was incredibly consequential because it meant that cable modem as a platform was available to everybody in the residential market it if you were in a metropolitan area where a cable network existed. Had it not been for the local government franchising requirements back when the networks were first deployed in the 70s and 80s, these networks would only have gone to the places where the return on investment was greatest. And this, I think, is one of the great um, stories that has been to the benefit of the community, but also in the long run to the benefit of the industry as a form of regulation that really worked from the standpoint of access. Does all of this mean the story of cable modem in rural areas? Unfortunately, this is um, where I think it is absolutely worst because cable modem was simply never deployed. Cable networks were never deployed back in the 70s and 80s in rural areas. They exist in lots of smaller towns and cities in rural communities, but not in the less dense areas around them. And in frequent cases, the smaller networks that do exist in small towns, in, um, in rural areas, there might be the density of a few thousand people living in a town together. There might be a cable network there, but the investment in that, those networks is not always as strong as it has been in more metropolitan areas where the networks are owned by larger companies. So we move out into rural areas, you know, you lose cable as a platform in its entirety in the most rural areas, but it's a weaker platform in some smaller towns, not all, but some, and that's a huge challenge. But I would, from an urban standpoint, one of the core challenges here is that small business story, and it's unfortunately not something that is captured on the national broadband map or other kinds of mapping efforts, and the reason is that it's at a level of granularity that our maps simply don't catch. But in general, I think you will find that small businesses just don't have access to this infrastructure which means that the only infrastructure they do have, unless there's a competitive provider in that market, is the DSL infrastructure. And uh, we all know the weaknesses of DSL, and, um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, DSL in an area where there is no competitor, there's no cable modem competitor at all, um, will be invested in, will not be quite as affordable, will just not perform in the same way. Small businesses, that's really a concern. The weaknesses of DSL from a capacity and performance standpoint are also really a problem, even in metro areas, for, for the residential market. And the reason for that is if DSL is the only viable compared to cable modem service, it has to be really viable. It has to be able to perform in order to compete. And the story of DSL over the past 10 or 12 years is that a kind of souped-up fancy version of DSL was deployed by a couple of the phone companies. AT&T's version of this was called Uverse, and it was the way by which they tried to get into the cable business as well by pushing as hard as they could to get more bits through those old copper wires. But getting into the cable business then meant that there was less capacity on this relatively not capable network, there was less capacity for data service, for internet service. Um, AT has actually reversed that in the last couple of years and is not offering video or is backing off video um, over those wires so as to reserve as much capacity as possible for data. And they're now using their DirecTV satellite product for video because they need as much of the capacity of those old copper wires as possible. In areas that did not see something like the AT&T Uverse upgrade, Wizen's fiber to the home upgrade, what you have are DSL networks that are 
really not just the, the transmission medium built or developed in the late 19th century, but the electronics, the, the actual... The actual, 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 actual. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, I heard myself I heard myself reverberating there. Please, everyone, check to sure that we are on mute. Thank you. I'm hearing myself to some degree. I hope you all are not hearing me as much. Um, The electronics we are talking about now for the DSL networks that were not upgraded, in some cases, the electronics from technologies that were built in that early internet, that early broadband internet era at the beginning of the broadband time period by the phone companies back in the late 1990s. And when you see DSL neighborhoods where the service is less than a megabit or is up to a megabit and a half, best case scenario, even two or three, up to two or three megabits, part of the reason for that is that the electronics have not been upgraded in a very, very long time. The reason for that is that we simply don't see the phone companies investing in these networks anymore. There was a time when the U-verse upgrade was, was a pretty modest upgrade because what AT&T was trying to do was to extend the life of that old copper as much as possible. But it was at least an upgrade and an effort to compete in the market. In the same way, Verizon's Fios fiber to the premises um, demand of about 10 years ago was a significant investment and a real upgrade of the network all happening in that particular time period. In more recent years, what we found, I think, is that the phone companies just really aren't interested in those DSL networks anymore. And this is a major problem, not just for neighborhoods where the service is really bad in metropolitan areas, but in rural areas as well. It's a critically um, big problem. What I find just about everywhere in rural communities I travel to um, the phone company is also in the wireless business, is that we find that the phone company is just no longer focusing on its wireline infrastructure for residences and phone businesses, at, excuse me, small businesses at all. The issue of what happens is that um, if a customer is currently getting their DSL service, they can continue to purchase it. When they cancel, they're done. They can't call back and get it back. And when somebody calls for new service, they're told, sorry, we just don't have the ports available. We can't take on any more customers. But if someone drops their service, a new customer is not added, has been my um, observation. They just drop that customer and don't add back new ones. Supporting those networks and expanding service would require investments in new electronics and probably in new transmission media and new infrastructure out in the field, and simply not happening. Companies like Frontier that have more of a stake um, on the wireline side because they don't own a wireless business, there's a little bit more attention to that. But for the most part, when we're talking about companies like AT&T and Verizon, we're simply not seeing new investment happening in that way. So service in some cases is actually deteriorating significantly. And as much as I'm seeing this in rural areas, I am also seeing it in certain urban areas. Networks aren't being upgraded, and new customers simply aren't being added to the networks. So as we are concerned about a lack of, of competition and how that lack of competition um, impacts and diminishes affordability, I actually think that is a problem that is expanding and increasing, not diminishing. Um, this is a big part of the wireline story. Obviously, there's the fiber to the premises piece of it, and let me just add a couple of thoughts on that, and then we can go on to wireless. And I hope this is all giving you a sense and illustration of how these different technologies intersect with each other and, and how their evolution has impacted availability and thus competition and affordability. The fiber to the premises piece, I think, is... Um, Critically important and unfortunately not as positive a story as it is now, as it was even um, 
six or nine months ago. The fiber to the presses is it's the holy grail of infrastructure. Hopefully I don't have to tell this community why it's so important and, and why it's an infrastructure that we will all be using the rest of our lifetimes. Um, I want the, my one complaint with the slide, which was developed by my team, so I, uh, I take responsibility for it, but my one complaint with the slide is that that oval on fiber to the premises comes to an end at the right, and it shouldn't. It should extend out in the distance, because the key thing to understand about fiber all the way to the user is that it has theoretically unlimited capabilities. It will expand in its capacity it will end in its ability to support as much transmission as necessary over time. And um, 10 gigabit consumer products are available in certain parts of the country already. They're not in particularly much demand, quite frankly, unless somebody's running a home-based business. But we will, within the next decade, be talking seriously about 10 gigabit consumer products, and these fiber networks will be capable of delivering that. Cabotum will not. Uh, DSL will never get to that. Um, fiber is the infrastructure that will make it possible. And there are two pieces to the fiber story that I think are critically important. One is how fiber impacts affordability. Fiber itself is not a cheap technology to build. It's unbelievably expensive, actually. But the, because of the Google Fiber initiative, which you know, we are all familiar with and we all know has um, sort of um, slowed dramatically and maybe even come to an end over the course of the past few months, but the happened with the Google Fiber initiative is that Google's pricing of a symmetrical gigabit at $70 established a market target such that every single gigabit fiber product that I have seen anywhere in the country, whether it's Google's, municipal, or private sector of any other sort, is somewhere within $80 of that $70 mark, $20 below or within $20 above. Never see anything beyond that. And while $70 may be a really consequential amount of money when we're talking about digital inclusion, and frankly, it certainly is, um, error, though, is a, a price that has been established as a market leader and metric that is not thousands of dollars per gigabit, which is where pricing, to the extent a gigabit was available before the Google Library Initiative, is where it was. Um, and once the network is there, it's an extremely efficient and effective network, and per gigabit pricing, I would anticipate, will come down, so loss there is competition. The key thing about the Google Fiber story, I think, is not just what Google offered, but how the industry reacted to what Google did. And what we saw in Google Fiber markets was not just new investment in new network by the phone and cable companies, primarily the phone companies, but we saw pricing coming down dramatically. Sort of self-evident. I wish it were more self-evident to Washington policymakers that competition is a good thing from a pricing and a service standpoint, but um, there's no doubt whatsoever. Um, Blair Levin, the architect of the National Broadband Plan, likes to say that there is a 100% overlap between um, Google Fiber bill areas and um, areas where AT&T and CenturyLink um, have built as well. 100% okay. of the markets where Google Fiber built or announced they might build saw upgrades by the incumbent phone companies and, um, and also pricing changes. So um, one more on that related to um, the impact of New fiber to the premises, which unfortunately is still in a very small fraction of the United States, but in the sense that the phone companies reacted by doing some um, incremental and uneven fiber upgrades, the cable industry has reacted in a somewhat different way. If all what I said just a few minutes ago about the cable industry holding and owning a transmission medium in the form of the hybrid fiber coax networks that were developed in the 70s rather than 100 years earlier, that they had this much more capable infrastructure. The nature of the cable network is that the cable industry, rather than having to build fiber all the way to the home in order to get to gigabit, 2 gigabit, 10 gigabit, 20 gigabit speeds, the cable industry is able to get to up to a gigabit downstream through what is largely an electronic 
upgrade. So by switching out DOCSIS 3.0 modems for DOCSIS 3.1 modems, which is the next generation of cable modem technology, which COMS, for example, is deep into doing right now and says it will be done with by the end of 2019 throughout its service footprint in the United States. By doing this electronics upgrade to DOCSIS 3.1, as an example, the Charter also and the other companies will be able to get to these much faster speeds. What's interesting from an access and affordability standpoint about that, not the technology so much as it is an outcome of the technology, which is when you do an electronics upgrade like that, it doesn't make sense to just upgrade parts of the city and not the other parts. Comcast switches out. DOCS 3.0, it will switch it out for an entire service territory or an entire franchise area, which means that if you have cable modem, if you have cable infrastructure that passes your home, you will be upgraded. If you are a customer, you will, you will be upgraded to DOCSIS 3.1. They're going to do it for the entire service territory rather than on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood basis. This is another positive outcome of just a sort of historical accident of how the cable networks were built. But what it means is that unlike with the phone companies, upgrades won't be selective, won't be neighborhood-based, won't be based on any kind of dem demographic consideration. And I think that's going to be really important as cable modem moves to faster speeds. Okay. Let me stop there on the, the wireline side, uh, and I hope there will be questions about what this all of this might mean, um, because I um, may or may not be anticipating some of your concerns or considerations, so I would love to be directed by all of you about what you'd like to hear. But let me tell you the story about what all of this means on their list side as we look below the line. All of this is probably relatively self-evident. The that are most important here are the red uh, ovals, and this is carrier mobile technology. This is the the, um, the new, um, technology that the phone companies use to deliver um, carrier cellular, um, as opposed to the kinds of technologies that we all use in our homes and maybe even around neighborhoods. Wi-Fi and other kinds of technologies that consumers can deploy. Here I'm very much focused on the carrier technologies and the available um, services. And I think you all know the story of how we went from early, early cellular to you know, what you might call um, 2 or 2.5 G, which is edge technology, which was the early data services over our phones, to 3G. Uh, which is still what is available in many rural areas, and now to 4G, which is technology that most of us who live in, in metropolitan areas have available and which can get us to optimal circumstances if things are going well and the network's not too congested and there's a lot of people um, streaming video in that moment, you probably get a reliable few megabits per second, uh, enough that you can stream video over your phone, which usually takes five to seven megabits. Consistent um, technology. Um, green oval for LTE advanced, the other technologies that will come with that, refers to one of the many different kinds of things that are at the moment hyped as something called 5G. And 5G does not really have a definition at the moment. It's more of a marketing term than anything else. But 5G is probably a, um, a an active way to group together the much faster um, West technologies that are likely to emerge over the next 10 years. I want to be really clear about this. Not over the next 10 months, but over the next 10 years, um, with a standard emerging at a, probably around 2020 is the expectation. Some of these technologies will be mobile that will support mobility, um, and some of them will be fixed. And um, that's one of the really intriguing pieces of what that looks like is will 5G technologies become um, a partial alternative to fiber to the premises or not? Um, and at the moment, they're not really any cheaper. There are some prototype technologies that are out there, but they're not a whole lot cheaper than fiber to the premises. 
part of the reason for that is that the technology is not developed, but it, the most important thing to know, I think, and the most important reason why this is not cheap to deploy is that the, you know, all of those different technologies, whether mobile or fixed, are going to require massive amounts of fiber to function with these kinds of speeds. So when you see the screen oval going over to the right, all the way to a gigabit per second, a couple things you need to know about that. Number one is that could be a gigabit per second on the mobile side that is shared among me, you, and everybody else who is using the same cell as us. So I'm not getting a dedicated gigabit per second to that scenario. But slightly, that fiber is going to have to come really, really close to where the phone is um, in order for that wireless to perform at that level. Our engineers say is kind of to give me a framework for understanding how much fiber it will require. Is they say that in a metropolitan area, mobile 5G will probably require fiber to every third or fourth or fifth block in a neighborhood, more in a downtown, very urban area. And fixed 5G will probably require fiber to every block, maybe every other block. So, probably 80% of the fiber to get to fixed wireless that you would require for fiber to the home. Why I bring all of this up when what we're talking about is access and affordability and availability, I bring it up because I think it speaks to pricing and how close these technologies really are and how much of a solution they're likely to provide. Fixed wireless, it seems to me, for these kinds of speeds is still a long way off and is not necessarily more attainable for most communities than fiber to the premises, given how massive the investment will be in order to make it happen. It is not a much, much cheaper solution. And that means it's not likely to break through and create the kinds of affordable options uh, in certain markets or in lower income neighborhoods or in rural areas. Um, that can start to think of it as being a logical alternative to fiber to the premises. Another piece of this that I think is important is just how much fiber will be required. Now, here's another piece that I think is, in some ways, maybe the most interesting part of all of this, and then I'm going to stop and look forward to your questions. These two lines, or these two parts of the, the chart, the part above the line and the part below the line, um, interest in some ways in terms of the identity of the companies, because we know that the phone companies, so that DSL line, which is um, the ovals owned by the phone and phone companies, um, are the same as the wireless technologies owned by the um, phone companies below. Same companies doing the those networks and using some of the same uh, uh, backbone infrastructure to support it. What we've never had before, though, is the cable companies active below the line, as it were. And yet that is something that is coming. And what's critically important about this, I think, is what it might mean for competition and availability and affordability for American consumers. We know that for the past several years, at least, um, probably even beyond that, as the phone company has been upgrading and supporting its existing infrastructure, it has been putting into the field and into all of our homes what are effectively uh, Wi-Fi radios. So um, if I have cable modem in my home, there's Wi-Fi within my home from a Wi-Fi radio that's supplied me by, in my case, Comcast, and that is for the exclusive use of my family here in my home, and it's powerful password protected and so on. What I might not be aware of is there's another Wi-Fi radio actually on that same box that I have no access to, that I have no control over, but that is going to supply Wi-Fi signals around my home. And because so much of my neighborhood has Comcast and we all have this in our home, what we have emerging in Comcast and in Charter and in other um, big cable areas is a new product that is um, effectively going to be um, a mix of Wi-Fi that would provide an alternative to um, provide alternative to carrier mobile. Within the next six months, the cable industry will be in the position to start competing with the phone industry on mobile products. 
And even though the cable industry does not have infrastructure in rural areas, what they have is the ability to resell the phone company's wireless capacity in those rural areas. So if I become a consumer of a cable mobile product, I will have access that is at least as good as, if not better than, much of what I could get from Sprint or T-Mobile or another company that does a lot of reselling in rural areas. And at the same time, we see companies like Google, through products like Google Fi, doing something very similar to that, but they're reselling a lot more because they have as much of a wireline footprint themselves. This is one of the exciting things that has happened in our field in many years because it means that on the mobile side for these mobile products that are so critically important, particularly in lower income areas where wireline products may not be affordable or both products may not be affordable, there's going to be potentially considerably more competent and I think this may be one of the reasons that in the past couple of months we've seen AT&T, for example, go back to a sort of unlimited data product, which is the world that we were in before they started imposing mobile data caps about seven, eight years ago. Um, and those mobile data caps have been incredibly disturbing from an affordability and accessibility <laughs> basis because I work, for example, in certain rural areas where the only product available is 3G or 4G mobile broadband product. There's nothing else because the DSL is so bad and there's no cable. But even if they were content to live with the slower speeds of mobile data, a family could not use that mobile data product over the past eight years um, on a consistent basis because after two hours of use of video, um, which is something you can do with just a little bit of Sesame Street or downloading a homeschooling curriculum. After two hours, they would hit their bandwidth cap for the month, and then they would be priced on a per megabit basis. This was incredibly problematic from an access and affordability standpoint because it essentially took the mobile data products out of the picture as far as the set of options available for people in rural areas urban areas also, and that's huge from an affordability standpoint. The potential advent of all of this new competition in mobile, um, we appear to be seeing, and I think there is a link, um, this new um, pricing from AT&T and the market following suit to some degree for unlimited. Now, it's, it's not entirely unlimited because when you use enough data, they then throttle you, so you're getting much slower speeds. But it's no longer something where if you use a lot of data, you could get a bill at the end of the month for thousands of dollars. So, an incredibly positive development in this way that has to do with the, the evolution of the networks and the cable modem platform and the cable platform now being expanded in new ways. Um, the negative on this whole story is I'm sure you are all hearing the same buzz that I am about a potential merger between phone and cable companies that Verizon has considered buying Comcast or buying Charter. Um, and we appear to live in a period when both the FCC and the Justice Department are likely to be very friendly to uh, merger um, applications. A merger between cable and phone in this case would not only decimate the small amount of competition we have on the wireline side, but would have the potential to really kill this new emerging competition on the mobile side. And I think for that latter reason, it's almost more troubling than for the former reason. So um, let me stop there, and hopefully um, you all have questions, and I hope I have hit some of the pieces of the story of um, how the evolution of these networks has impacted availability and affordability. It was fabulous. Thank you. Uh, there's a little bit of chatter going on in the Q&A section, but there's no actual questions for you. It's more just people. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, a couple of things here that are uh, maybe not quite questions, but uh, provocative, yes. provocative statements, and let me see if I can get to them. Um, I, folks, I, I'm sure most of you would not do this 
but please do not let anyone in the industry convince you that um, satellite is an adequate alternative. It's obviously, it's, slow, it's costly, it has all kinds of latency issues. Um, it is going to be in some very, very rural areas the only option for some time to come, but that doesn't mean that policymakers should ever allow um, it to be said that it is an alternative. And, and I think that the industry hype around the light is, um, is uh, even more effective in some ways than the, the hype around 5G and, um, and, and we're being cautious about because it, it simply does not um, provide any um, adequate solutions, particularly for someone who um, has this challenge with regard to affordability. I see the comment where somebody said um, DSL is still not available in any parts of Stevens County, Washington, um, and that's Bert. Um, Bert on that is that if DSL is not available, it, it's probably not coming. We're not seeing expansion of DSL networks. It, the, um, that time has sort of come and gone. What the industry is telling the FCC and telling state legislatures is that uh, wireless uh, broadband, mobile broadband, will be the alternative to wireline, and all of the investment is going into that side of things. The one place where we see some DSL development happening is in areas that are funded through the Connect America Fund um, that provides some support to certain phone companies for um, uh, ongoing operations of DSL networks of around uh, 10 by 1. Um, but you know, even there, it's a relatively uh, short-term proposition. It's not clear to me how robust those upgrades are. Although if any of you are in those areas and you're seeing data in that regard, I would be really interested um, to, to hear what you are seeing. Um, and if you'll, the networks are really coming on board the way they're supposed to, and if they're meeting the speed requirements, and speed requirements are going to be enforced by the FCC. Joanne, she, um, there's a couple questions on right now. One has to do with how you see um, technologies such as Balloon or Facebook's drone internet service. Um, are those real possibilities? Could they be actual solutions for folks? Um, that is a really great question. Um, there's a whole lot of like speculation and chatter among industry analysts about these technologies. I, I would say, um, I would not count on them in any significant way in in the future. My understanding of um, Google's Loon project is that they've backed off it to some degree already and that the investment has really slowed in that regard. And what Facebook is doing with drones seems primarily focused, at least for now, on um, expanding and improving its delivery capabilities and its footprints. Um, the, the bulk of the trials that we've seen and the pens that they have applied for appear to be focused on um, um, delivery of um, uh, I'm just like flipping through my notes here to see if I can find more information on this. Oh, sorry, I'm mistaking this um, with, let me go back. Amazon's delivery footprint, Amazon working on a drone strategy for delivery. Um, I've been talking for too long. Here's an interesting thing where we don't know what this means, but it could have interesting consequences down the road in that Amazon has started to deploy and has patents for um, drones that are internet connected and um, have radios connected to them, and that would be docking on streetlights and other kinds of infrastructure, and that are essentially, in some ways, floating hotspots. It's one place that I would say it's kind of an interesting thing to keep tracking. Um, as far as all of these different options, including Facebook's, 
I, I would take these seriously. These are companies that are putting real money into it, although Google seems to have really backed off. But at the same time, I think when you think about capacity and speed and what these kinds of technologies will be capable of delivering, um, are they going to really transform availability and pricing? I have to remain dubious. So much still depends, such on the wireless front, still depends on what those wireline networks are, how robust they are, and how much competition there is in those networks. Thank you. Can, we are at 2 o'clock. Can I ask one more quick question, because it's come up a couple times in the Q&A. Um, sure. the, the idea of uh, fixed wireless. Um, so uh, Bill Valley asked a, about a specific project, but uh, we also have a couple of speakers coming to Net Inclusion talking about fixed wireless. We're seeing this in multiple um, neighbors, both urban and rural, that are using fixed wireless as a solution. Um, what is your experience with that? Can you give us any insight? Um, yeah, um, sure. So it, these these fixed wireless products, and I see um, Bill specifically mentions the Ciclu products, and Ciclu is the Israeli company that um, actually um, I, I think made the biggest split in the space so much so far. It, this is all part of that bigger story about 5G and this emerging 5G hype. Um, the the fixed wireless products from 5G, the ones that are being deployed right now, and Ciclu is the leader in that, um, these are still essentially prototype technologies. As I said, the 5G standard doesn't exist yet. It's anticipated it will emerge sometime around 2020 or thereafter. And a standard just means everybody's building based on the same basic um, uh, standard. <laughs> Forgive the term. Um, I'm not technical enough to be able to come up with a, a synonym for that, but um, and which that it's a standards-based technology rather than entirely everyone building in ways that are not in any way interoperable. But what these technologies require here is still a very robust um, fiber um, uh, footprint. So the Ciclu equipment is being used by a company called Monkey Brains in uh, San Francisco has probably been used most extensively there um, to reach multi-dwelling units. It's also it's one of the technologies that Google's um, warehouse division uses to go from rooftop to rooftop among multi-dwelling units in certain urban areas. And it's very um, capable in this regard because it can move large amounts of data on a point-to-point um, -point basis. Uh, assuming that it has line of sight, meaning no obstructions, and you know, subject to some challenges around rain and snow and so on that will cause some fading. What it doesn't do yet, although it appears that they have a new product that is being developed but has not been deployed anywhere or tested in an extensive way yet, it doesn't do a lot of point to multipoint. So you're still in a position where deploying this technology could be cost effective to go from rooftop to rooftop from one apartment building to another apartment building and there and share the bandwidth within the apartment building over the existing inside wiring, right? That's what WebPass does. So that's a cost effective way to move all that bandwidth from rooftop to rooftop rather than having to build fiber to get it to the building. But it's less cost effective to do that for single family homes on a home by home basis. So I'm not sure if I'm quite answering the question, but my concern about these technologies is the sense that somehow because it's wireless, it's a lot cheaper. And we we're not really seeing evidence of that yet. We're not seeing evidence that these G in this case it's sub millimeter wave, very fast technologies are yet a whole lot cheaper. Deeper. In the future, they might be when we get to scale and the the production is much cheaper. Um, but right now, it's so early in the development and deployment cycle. There, it it's still more hype, I think, around affordability than it is actual reality. I'll also say, as a consultant to local government, we just about 
recommend this for local government investment, and the reason is that the technologies are really new, and um, we don't know what it's going to look like three or five years from now, and um, it's great companies are going to take that risk. I'm all, I'm totally good with that. Let's see how it pans out, but um, I think for a nonprofit or a public sector entity, there's um, there's some it's there's some experimentation involved in using these technologies, which is perfectly fine as long as you're aware of the fact that they are hardly established yet. But answer that question. Yeah, that's fabulous, Thank you, Joanne. I think we're going to wrap up. We so appreciate your time, and this has been recorded, and we will get it posted ASAP for folks to share. Nice talking with all of you. Thank you. Yes, and we will have Joanne back at Net Inclusion. So if you want to talk, folks want to talk to her directly, <laughs> join us in St. Paul. Hey, Angela. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.